All righty. Thank you all so much for joining. My name is Tomas Talamante, Deputy Chief of Staff to Mayor Bowser. We want to thank you for being on uh, today's community leader call on the district's response to COVID-19. Uh, uh, and again, we want to remind everyone uh, for the most up-to-date information and resources, uh, please visit coronavirus.dc.gov. Again, that's coronavirus.dc.gov uh, for all of your most up-to-date information, resources, and other items. Uh, we will now uh, pass it over to Mayor Bowser to get the call started. So, Mayor, uh, you are live. <clears throat> Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I want to start by thanking you for your leadership during these unprecedented times. Uh, we are certainly all reminded that we're all in this together and we will get through it together. Uh, I want to make a, another reminder. It's National Census Day, so please continue to urge residents, your constituents, the people in your networks to fill out their census forms or do it online or by phone, uh, and they can learn more by going to 2020census.gov. As you know, this week, uh, we, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia, all issued stay-at-home orders, and each day you've heard a consistent message from me and everyone in district government, and that's to stay home. Um, and to be clear, uh, this has been our message for several weeks. Uh, there's no real difference between the direction uh, that we gave this week and what we have been telling you, from closing down our schools to bars and restaurants and entertainment facilities uh, to all essential businesses. So uh, let me make it plain. The only reason people should be leaving their home is to obtain medical care, food, or other essential household goods perform an essential job or governmental function, work at an essential job, engage in essential travel, or to exercise. Uh, this morning we began uh, reporting our COVID-19 data by age, group, gender, and ward. Uh, we reported 91 new uh, confirmed cases in the district, bringing our overall cases to 586. And sadly, uh, I also reported that 11 um, district residents succumb to COVID-19 um, and have died. Uh, regarding the ward by ward data, uh, my message to everyone is no matter which ward you live in, you need to be staying at home. Uh, we are all eager to be getting back to normal life, and the way that we do that is to flatten the curve and keep each other safe. And when we do get to the other side of this, we will recover together. Uh, we know that many of our residents are feeling uh, anxiety about lost wages right now. Um, we, and they should know that federal assistance and unemployment benefits are arriving soon. Additionally, the district's economic recovering, recovery team is developing additional assistance programs as the emergency continues. There is more information about these programs and other resources on coronavirus.dc.gov. So um, with that, we are, um, will now hear a brief report from Dr. LaQuandra Nesbitt, who leads the district's health department, DC Health. Dr. Nesbitt. So thank you, Mayor Bowser, for your continued leadership during this time. Uh, I want to continue to express my uh, sympathy and condolences to the families and all of our residents who have been impacted today uh, by the impacts of COVID-19 in our community. Uh, since our first reported positive case of COVID-19 in the district, we've had 586 residents test positive and 142 residents have been cleared from isolation and have recovered. Uh, that, this means that um, today we continue to report more aggregate data and we invite you to take a look at our coronavirus at dc.gov website uh, to see the new ways that we are providing data to our community. About 53% of the positive cases in the district have occurred in males and nearly 50% of positive cases have been in persons between the ages of 19 and 40 while 19% of positive cases have been in individuals over the age of 60. Among the 586 positive COVID-19 cases in the district, we have confirmed that 80 were hospitalized, uh, which translates to a 14% hospitalization rate in the District of Columbia. You may recall that very early on when we were 
uh, trying to understand what the impact or experience of COVID-19 would be in the district and in the United States, uh, we knew that in China, about 80% of individuals would have mild symptoms or had mild symptoms that did not require hospitalization. Uh, about 15% of people required hospitalization in just an acute care setting, and about 5% of individuals would require ICU care. Uh, so what we know now in the district is about 14% of our cases have required some form of hospitalization. Uh, we also know that the average age of hospitalized individuals uh, has been 59 years of age. So while the nearly half of our cases have occurred in individuals 19 to 40, there are early indications that there is a more severe form of illness requiring hospitalization for people who are older. I also want to make sure that we highlight um, the importance of making sure that if you are not in your usual state of health uh, or that if you have any fever, cough, or shortness of breath, that you call your health care provider and get some advice as to whether or not you should be seeking care. Um, we are also beginning to note that children under the age of 10 may have some atypical signs and symptoms of COVID-19, including loss of appetite. And in the elderly, they also may have atypical symptoms of COVID-19, such as being uh, complaining of being, fatig being fatigued, having body aches, or being overall tired. Um, we want you to make sure that you're reaching out to your health care providers if you're not in your usual state of health uh, to help, them, help you determine whether or not it is safe for you to stay at home and provide self-care and recover safely at home, or if your condition is worsening and you should go into their office uh, to receive care or to um, go to an emergency room uh, and if your condition requires hospitalization. Uh, today we began to provide maps in the city showing where our cases are occurring by ward, uh, and we can, it is uh, demonstrating that the higher case counts or the most, more cases of COVID-19 are occurring in wards six, four, and three. However, the data is based on place of residence and not place of exposure. Uh, so we ask that no inferences or conclusions be drawn in terms of where the geographic uh, number of cases are located in the district at this time. Uh, what this means is that we have not identified any hot spots, so to speak, in the district for COVID-19. And looking at our geographic map does not indicate that one ward has a higher propensity for being uh, a risk of infection at this point than any other. And more importantly, since we are asking all residents to stay home, that is the greatest thing that you can do to recre decrease the risk of transmission uh, at this point. All residents should stay at home and not leave home unless you are seeking essential services uh, such as health care uh, and food or unless you are an essential worker. And lastly, I just want to conclude by making sure that we reiterate the very important things that all of us can do to decrease transmission, uh, such as avoiding close contact with people who are sick, washing your hands often with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, and if you don't have soap and water available, using an alcohol-based hand sanitizer, avoiding touching your eyes, nose, and mouth with unwashed hands, covering your cough or sneeze with a tissue and then throwing that tissue immediately into a trash receptacle, and then cleaning and disinfecting frequently touched objects and, and surfaces. So again, we all know that these are very challenging and unprecedented times for us and often uncertain times for many of us who are adapting to a, a very different way of life, but these are important times for us to do the things that we know will decrease the trans risk of transmission uh, such as staying home and adopting safe practices that will help to decrease the risk of transmission in the district and help us uh, flatten the curve here uh, in Washington, D.C. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Dr. Nesbitt. Uh, and we're also joined by HCMA Director Christopher Rodriguez, uh, who can provide a brief situational update of our emergency operations. 
Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Dr. Nesbitt. Uh, uh, the Homeland Security Emergency Management Agency continues to uh, support and uh, administer the district's emergency operations center here at the D.C. Department of Health. Um, we are wrapping a lot of services around uh, the Department of Health and other supporting uh, district uh, agencies. We, um, we have uh, also a lot of federal agencies here. We have FEMA, um, the National Guard, uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, um, and we continue to collaborate and, uh, and talk to them on a daily basis on our plan operational planning and uh, making sure we have situational awareness not only here in the district but in our region and, and across the country. Um, per the mayor's direction, uh, late last week, we uh, made a request to FEMA and to the White House for a major disaster declaration, uh, which was approved in 24 hours. Um, and what that allows uh, the district to do, um, it opens up a variety of, uh, of activities related to the COVID-19 response and recovery efforts uh, for federal reimbursement. So, um, and in that vein, uh, HCMA is um, assisting our district agencies in properly uh, cataloging and collating our COVID-19 related expenses um, so that we are in a strong position to uh, apply for federal reimbursement, not only through FEMA, but through a variety of other federal agencies whose programs um, we anticipate will come online, including the Federal Department of Health and Human Services. Um, in terms of our daily operational posture, um, re regular meetings uh, with the mayor to ensure she has the latest information uh, to make some of the key executive decisions that we um, that we need throughout this process and ensuring that um, all of the district agencies are coordinated in our uh, response okay. efforts. Going forward, um, we will continue to be here at the D.C. Department of Health uh, through the duration of this event, and we'll continue to monitor, uh, again, uh, the evolution of COVID-19 in the district and throughout the region. So thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. Um, so with that, Tomas, I think we, we have time for a few questions. Great, thank you, Mayor. Uh, again, if you have any questions on uh, for the mayor or for uh, our directors, please press zero now. We'll be adding it to our question queue. Uh, so we do have a, a first question. We're going to go to Aaron Wade in Ward Five. Aaron, uh, you are alive and able to speak. Hi, thank you, Madam Mayor, and the rest of the team for all the work that you all are doing to keep us safe in the district. I appreciate it so much. I'm the pastor of the Community Church of Washington, D.C., and I'm on the LGBTQ Advisory Board. Two questions have come from my constituents that I would love to get some answers for. Uh, the first question is, what will individuals need to do if they are pulled over by an officer and they are heading to an essential service like the grocery store? Will they just simply explain and they'll be able to go on about their business or do they need to present something? That's the first question. The second one is, for self-employed individuals and contractors, when will they be able to apply through DOES for the pandemic unemployment assistance that was talked about in the CARE Act? Thank, thank you for that. Well, first of all, let me um, just say our police are not directed to pull people over to check where they're going. Um, and if uh, you are pulled over for some other reason, I would just simply, you know, give the, the officers the information that they need, but no one will be pulled over for the purpose of stating what the nature of their travel is. Um, we do continue to remind people, though, to follow uh, that guidance. I think your second uh, question was on unemployment and um, what would contractors have to do. Uh, we are going to be getting some additional guidance and have one of my um, briefings be focused on unemployment. I don't think all of the changes that came through the CARES Act are yet applicable to our system, um, but just as soon as they are, we will make the necessary changes and get that information out to independent contractors. Uh, we do think we regard it as very good news um, that the, the bill allows independent contractors to collect unemployment. It's going to provide a lot of relief uh, to D.C. residents. Thank you, Mayor. We'll go next to Ms. Oldenburg uh, in Ward 6. You, uh, Your line is open. 
Ms. Oldenburg, your line is open. Hello. Yes, uh, so Ms. Oldenburg, uh, question. There you go. Yeah. Sorry, I had the mute on. This is Commissioner okay. Oldenburg, 6004. And yes, ma'am, Commissioner. I want to thank, thank the mayor and all the officials on all the really difficult work that they're doing for all of us um, during this period. Um, much appreciated. But I wanted to ask, um, I think Dr. Nesbitt had given out some statistics, and I wanted to make sure I copied them down right. Um, uh, she said that gave out a number of recovered patients, or, percent, or maybe it was a percent, and also the average age of those who have required hospitalization. Yes, ma'am. So... Our uh, total number of residents who have recovered is 142, and the average age of hospitalized residents is 59 years of age. All right, thanks. We will get uh, go to our next question uh, from Janice F. in Ward 4. Janice, you are live. Good afternoon, this is Janice Farabee in Ward 2. I'm Advisory Neighborhood Commissioner 2F08. Um, thank you Hi, so Janice. much, Mayor Bowser. Hi. Thank you, everyone, for all that you're doing, your leadership. Um, I have several buildings, clusters that have students that attend Thompson Elementary School, a large Latino population, concerned about three things, the fear of them going to be tested, and you mentioned, you know, that no one is going, no questions are going to be asked, but how can I make them a little bit more um, feel more safe, and that goes also to the 2020 census as we want to get as many people counted as possible. And then the last is many of them have issues with helping their students at home with learning. How can I be more helpful to that constituency? Well, thank you um, for for that question. Um, and I would first start direct you. I'm going, I'm looking for the number that we're asking. Um, people to call for medical advice, especially if um, English is their second language. And um, Tomas, well, uh, you had that? Sure, it's John. Hey, Commissioner, uh, the number for the hotline is 844-796-2000. Uh, uh, Again, 844-796-2000. And as the mayor mentioned, that's in uh, Spanish and English. Um, and further on, uh, just more resources uh, while our, our kids are distant learning, the chancellor continues to put out um, some guidance and advice. And also the locations where students are picking up their take-home materials, there will be opportunities to kind of exchange information or ideas at the packet pickup. Um, but I would I would encourage you to look at DCPS website um, for more tips on distant learning. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. And uh, Commissioner, we're also going to be hosting a Spanish language community leaders call on the district's response uh, to COVID-19. And so we will, it's Saturday at 3 o'clock. We will make sure to get that information out to all the commissioners and community leaders on the call. Uh, so you can help spread the word for that call as well. Um, next, we'll go to uh, Mary Doland in Ward 4. Mary, your line is open. Oh, yes. Hi. Um, thank you, uh, Mayor Bowser and everyone, for everything that you're doing. Um, first question, actually, I actually have two questions. The first one is um, I'm a parent of a DCPS student, and I'm wondering if there is consideration for just completing the rest of the school year uh, relatively on time by only online learning. My second question is um, regarding the potential for a tremendous spike in uh, health care costs through the DC exchange and um, as a result of COVID-19 and how, how that can be prevented uh, for us self-employed folks to are already paying thousands of dollars a month for insurance. Thank you. Okay, thank you for those questions, Mary. 
Uh, let me start with the schools. Uh, we haven't made any determination beyond April 24th. Um, we, of course, are following how we're flattening the curve in D.C., uh, and we'll make an announcement uh, in, in probably in the next week or so, next two weeks, about uh, what the rest of the school year looks like. Um, but we haven't made that uh, decision yet. Uh, it will all be driven by uh, our ability to show in the city that we have decreasing um, infections uh, in our city. Uh, further, on the health care exchange, uh, I actually haven't um, been briefed by the, the exchange, um, but I will make sure I'm following up and have a, my health care cluster um, asking those types of questions and making sure where we need to seek relief or where our programs and services are going to be vulnerable to do all we can policy-wise to make sure um, that we're dealing with those effects head on. Thank you, Mayor. We will go next to uh, Commissioner Hamilton in Ward 6. Commissioner, your line is live. Um, hello. I just want to thank uh, Director Nesta and Mayor Bowser for all of your efforts. My question is, as it relates to um, access to food, I know there are multiple school sites that are open for meals for the children, but my concern is that there are a number of families that are very far away from grocery stores, and I know the Metro had also mentioned they have like one week of cleaning supplies. So are there any efforts underway to get food to neighborhoods that are in close proximity to grocery stores? Um, we have a number of uh, efforts underway, and thank you for that question. We've been very um, concerned about food access from the start. Um, we have over 20 sites that are serving school children and families uh, with meals. Uh, so please look at those um, at those sites. They are pretty well distributed uh, throughout the city. Uh, we've also been delivering to seniors who participate in our senior wellness center programs for food, and rather than have them have them come out. Um, we're getting the, the food to them. Uh, there also are many of our uh, nonprofit providers who are uh, providing food resources as well. But having said that, um, we recognize, especially if this goes on longer, that we will have to identify more food supports for vulnerable families. Um, and some of that planning is underway um, now. Uh, and we may adjust some distribution practices to hit everybody, to hit all of our vulnerable families. All right, thank you, Mayor. We're next going to go to Trupti Patel in uh, Ward 2. Trupti, you're alive. Or, sorry, your line is open. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor. Uh, Thank you for all everything you've been doing during this um, pandemic. Oh, we really appreciate it. Um, so my question for you, ma'am, is that uh, I am <clears throat> a tipped worker, a former tipped worker that got laid off due to the pandemic crisis. I, along with several hundred, probably several thousand of my colleagues um, in the industry, as well as not in the industry, had to file for unemployment. Um, a lot of us have faced long wait times on the phone. Uh, DOES has been great. The agents have been very helpful, very responsive when we've been able to get in touch with them. Um, however, um, there is a lot of anxiety because many people still have not gotten their unemployment benefits, and today was the, is the first, and rent was due for many of us, and we did not have the funds on hand that we expected to have to be able to pay our um, rent and any basic necessities to survive. And the question we have for you is, uh, when do we expect to have our funds released? Thank you. Well, I got to re thank you for that question. I certainly um, can understand that anxiety. Um, and we are, our hearts really break for a whole industry that was among the first to experience the economic devastation of COVID-19. So um, we're, we're thinking about you each and every day and want to make sure that those um, those benefits that you earned are are distributed. Uh, I 
understood from the DOES director today that some of the first distributions for people who signed up early and probably a lot of the restaurant workers are in this category um, because the job losses happened and restaurants uh, were among the first job losses. So those those distributions have already begun and will follow as people signed up. I also want to let you know that we uh, have two back-to-back -back meetings on how we can get DOES uh, more resources, more hands, um, basically, to help answer phones and help process claims. And so we, we've devised a few strategies over the last week, uh, and we're going to do even more uh, to try to get those those wait times down. Um, so uh, we, we appreciate it, and I just hope everyone recognizes that just like you didn't expect this to happen in your life, that our just our system and our number of employees to take calls and to answer questions um, is just no match for what the demand is. But we're working on building that up, and we'll get it done as soon as we can. All right, we got time for about two more questions, so we'll go next to Frederica Kramer. Frederica, you are uh, your line is open. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor, for all that you're doing and all of the uh, the agencies are doing. I really, it uh, gives one a little bit of solace of what's going on. I am particularly concerned about uh, construction projects. As you know, we have a tremendous amount of construction going on in, in um, ANC 6D. Uh, I was um, I want to know first of all whether there are new requirements for filing safety plans in the context of uh, of COVID-19, uh, uh, and if so, how do those get reviewed? How do we get review, uh, re to review them if possible? And um, will you or the health department be, the second part of this question is, will you or the health department be reviewing uh, the guidelines that were recently put out by, um, on construction uh, projects in particular? Um, one question is whether masks might not be, it might be uh, required uh, possible reduction in work um, in the work crews, the numbers of people that are, are allowed on site, and, and uh, possibly staggering work schedules. Um, a lot of these projects look like they're operating as usual. It's hard, there are a lot of workers on on the site. It's hard to we can't be inside the site to know what's going on. And the question is both concern to the workers themselves. Uh, who um, who are working in the, uh, close proximity, and obviously for what they bring home or to the rest of the community. Okay, and, and thank you for that question. And we have um, certainly put out uh, a, a lot of guidance on those projects um, that fall in the essential category. Uh, it, they directly relate to social distancing that's expected uh, in any essential work. And um, what I, I have to make sure that we're focused on, though, is the enforcement of um, those safe practices on these job sites. We do have the ability um, of always to pull a permit and stop construction. Um, and with this emergency order, for any business that's not in compliance with the order, and that, is, that includes safe um, social distancing, uh, would, would al also be subject to penalties. Thank you, Mayor. And our final question is coming from Dottie Love Wade in Ward 1. Dottie, your line is open. Hello, Mayor Bowser. Thank you for all of your great leadership. Um, Mike, can you hear me? I can, Dottie. Go ahead. Okay. Um, you know, we're being directed to um, contact our health care providers if we feel symptoms or are concerned and want to have a test taken. However, many of our citizens don't have health care providers that they can contact. So what are those citizens to do? Well, Dottie, all, just about, uh, I don't have to remind you, I'm sure, of the level of um, insured uh, people in, in D.C., and it's virtually everybody. Uh, we have thousands of people who participate in our plans that the government supports in one of our three managed health care providers. Um, others have private insurance, and many of those insure, or insurance providers 
have put up um, ways to contact them telephonically with um, video visits or telephone visits. So I, I would ask everybody to um, focus on, on even their insurance card and look at the number about where you should call and call it, call that number and call it immediately. Uh, we also provided a number earlier for some of our residents, some of our residents um, at Mary Center for 844-796-2797, and that's for anybody um, to, to call if you need to be uh, helped uh, to be directed to a health care provider. And Dr. Nesbitt is going to share another number. And we also want to remind people as well that MedStar has made the decision to make its e-visits platform available to people who are not uh, already affiliated with the MedStar Health System and its platform. And that has been especially helpful for our uh, community uh, where people um, have not already affiliated with a health care provider or a health system, and they believe they have signs and symptoms of COVID-19. And you can access that e-health platform if you have access to a, um, a, a smartphone, an e uh, a tablet, a laptop, et cetera, and you can get in contact with a healthcare provider and they'll do a clinical assessment for you and make, can make a decision as to whether or not you need to be tested for COVID-19 and then schedule an appointment for you to do so. Great, thank you. Okay. That's, that. That's it for our questions. So uh, again, we'll before we hear closing remarks from the mayor, just want to remind everyone uh, to visit coronavirus.dc.gov for all of your most up-to-date information resources on uh, the district's response as well as uh, recovery uh, efforts as well. So, uh, Mayor? Thank you uh, for that, Tomas. And I also um, wanted, I know there are a lot of ANC commissioners, community leaders, and neighborhood association folks, and I know you're fielding a lot of questions and calls from your neighbors. So I want to thank you for your leadership in the community. I also want to acknowledge all of our elected officials who I'm staying in close contact with, um, the chairman of the council and all the council members, the attorney general, and our congresswoman, Eleanor Holmes Norton. I also want to thank our, uh, the speaker of the house, who I had an opportunity to speak with a little bit earlier today. Um, and uh, she assures me that she continues to work on all issues uh, D.C. related. Uh, and also, I want to give credit where credit's due. You heard Chris Rodriguez mention that the White House uh, turned around our major declaration, uh, disaster declaration in 24 hours, and so I want to acknowledge um, that happened as well. So stay safe, stay home, uh, remind people in your life to stay home. Uh, they should only go out. They should only go out for essential business, essential work, um, or going to the grocery and getting food or exercise close to home. Uh, and I understand that tomorrow I may be on the Today Show, so I'll turn on at, at 9 a.m. Uh, when we talk to Craig Melvin. Have a have a great day, everybody.